everyone ready? Keyboard's working, judges ready? Okay, wonderful. Then starting time in three, two, one. I'm going to start with just a few definitions, clarifications, and an introduction of a counterfactual, then two arguments from government. Firstly, how we think this improves the way the white public interacts with minorities and minority art. Secondly, how the minorities interact with themselves and their art. Okay, so first kind of clarifications and a definition. We think that this house is just like society, like, you know, like just kind of a rational individual. Um, and the framework is going to be what's best, obviously, with like weighing about we care about more minorities, et cetera. Um, but just like pretty open-ended, whatever people weigh. Um, so I want to characterize the counterfactual a little bit because I think that just noting that this is a regrets motion, um, op is defending a world where they, or op is defending a preference that the existence of this narrative or of this art has been good. So we're, we think that we ought to evaluate not just in a vacuum if it's been good, but in the absence of that prominence, in the absence of that art, what is the types of art minorities would have been making? What is the types of art that is being celebrated by minorities? And what we would say probably is that it's a pretty wide range of art, right? So instead of one particular narrative or one particular type of focus focus of art emerging, for example, opulence, that there's a more general category. There are minority artists that might write about their identity or their experiences with, for example, American oppression as a Black artist or um, expressing their culture. But there are also minority artists that are going to write about breakups and heartbreak and being in love because those are universal human experiences. We think that there is something uniquely commercialistic about the opulence that means that it dominates the market. And in the absence of that, there's a more diversity of the types of art that minority artists are going to make. That's important context for our case and the round. It's a comparative that we think that both sides have to interact with. Okay, then um, two arguments. Firstly, on the general white public. Uh, and why we think that the existence of opulent art for minorities has been bad in the way that a white and majoritarian public interacts with that art and those artists. One, two, three, four, five, six reasons, I think. Okay, so the first is just that we think that oftentimes this art is depicting minorities that have been traditionally associated with poverty. So for example, there is a white bias against the belief that African Americans are wealthy or that people in the third world are wealthy. So it depicts these people that have generally not been associated with wealth as incredibly wealthy. The problem with that is that it because it depicts these people in opulent wealth, white consumers often believe as they're not um, like exposed to a lot of racial discourse or understandings of systems of racism because they live in their own communities of bias, they believe based on this art that the problem doesn't exist. So they say, hey, all, you know, I'm seeing at the, like in the Grammys, all of these black artists that are wearing really expensive jewelry and winning, winning Grammys about their songs about like being really wealthy. So obviously like race and racial inequality isn't a huge problem. Obviously this isn't true in all cases or for all people, but comparatively it veils the problem of wealth in terms of art, which is something that we think is really important to the way people conceptualize society in the world. Secondly, it makes the white population associate success with meritocracy. I'm gonna talk you through this a little bit. Cardi B is a black singer who had been a, she's talked very publicly about living in abject poverty, being a stripper and how she pulled herself up by her bootstraps. She wrote really good music and she became really rich and famous. Now she writes rap songs about being really wealthy. I think that when you're publicizing those narratives and it's front and centering her opulence and her wealth, there's a general belief amongst consumers that there isn't a problem of systemic racism or that it's not that challenging because other character, other African-American people, widely public figures have been able to overcome that. Again, that's not true in every case, but comparatively, it absolutely exists. Thirdly, um, the other types of black art or other types of minority art are comparatively better to issue a more empathetic response and a more relatable response from the public. The reason for that is I think opulence is very exclusive just to people that are wealthy. And that's regardless of race. Like, I don't have big, like, chains or, or you know, like, extravagant palaces. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I get $15 an hour. That's pretty cool um, for my job. So I think that any type of consumer feels disconnected from watching an artist that is not singing or talking about things that are related to them. Comparatively on our side, we have some artists, um, a minority artists that are writing about their culture and their struggles, which 
fosters empathy about a cause most people don't know. But they're also writing about universal human experiences, about being broken up with, which humanizes the Black experience, which reminds the white public that everyone deals with heartbreak. And on the ground, I think, for consumers, they're able to connect more with Black or minority or POC uh, artists, which we think is good. Uh, there's not... I. I condensed two of the mechanisms, so now on to the fourth. Um, we think that on their side of the house, they box in the perception of what Black or minority or POC art is and what that identity is. And the reason for that is it like opulence in this art dominates the stage because it's dazzling because whatever, whatever, whatever. That means that that occupies the, major the majority of a, you know, in like systems like, for example, in institutions like Hollywood that are very racist, they only allocate some space for these minority artists. If that space is filled with, for example, just opulent art, which we think in the static quote, status quote mostly has, that's all people see when they think Black art or minority art or Indian art, which means their perception of what it means to be an individual of that identity, especially an artist, is incredibly skewed. It doesn't allow for a wider range of identity. It makes it harder for people to relate, and it associates wealth with an identity when that's not necessarily always reflective. Um, and yeah, the last mechanism is the same, actually. <laughs> I box them all together. So the implication of this argument is, first of all, I think it's bad that all of these things are happening. Comparatively, it's much better because when you have a diversity of these types of art, you have better discourse about race issues. You have a white and majority public that's more empathetic, understanding, and connects more with these people, but also understands their struggles more and isn't veiled by a belief that they're wealthy when there are real systems that keep people down. I think that means that people feel more empathetic, but also that they act more in terms of policy or um, like voting to help these people on our side of the house. Second argument, how this is how minority communities interact better with art on our side of the house. Uh, three things to say, four things to say, we'll see. I'll, I'll line them. So firstly, we think that on their side of the house, they alienate the poor people. If it is the unfortunate reality in America that a lot of African Americans are poor. They're trapped in cycles of poverty by an institution of racism. When their only representation is someone wearing chains that are gold and diamond, they don't feel represented, they don't feel heard. I think that's bad. Secondly, there is a there is a self-selection bias where the types of artists that are making art about opulence are not necessarily ones that understand or represent their community the best. So it's the wealthiest African Americans or the wealthiest Indian, Indians of Bollywood, but they're taking up space in Hollywood. They're the ones dominating the discourse, which means they're squeezing out people that are able to talk about real experiences of those people and real struggles, which when, first of all, I think is important for representation because you want to hear people talking about things you've experienced. But secondly, if those are the only African-Americans in Hollywood with the platform, you want them talking about issues that matter to this community. Zach is going to give the rest of it. We give a better, more diverse range of experiences and are incredibly proud to propose. My computer is literally broken up. Um... I don't know what I'm going to do about this. One moment, please. Um, I mean... Okay, it's not great, but I think it, it'll be fine. Now it's, like, zooming me out to, like, 150%. I don't know how to fix it. Alrighty. Sophie, if your computer's, like, breaking, is there a different one you could use? or? Yeah, but I don't know where. It, it's fine. We'll We'll make it work. Um, great. My name is Sophie. Pronouns she, her, hers. POIs verbally. Um, Wi-Fi sitch. I say it to you guys all the time, so I'm sure you know. Um, but ask the POI again if I don't respond. Um, and yeah, let me know if I'm going too quickly. I'll begin my time of eight minutes starting... No. Gov gives you a great speech under their counterfactual. However, we think that counterfactual is entirely and completely wrong. We'll get into that in a second. Then we're going to go into side opposition's case, two contentions, free or first on why we're benefiting the minority, second, why we improve the quality of art. Then going to go into some responses to side government's case. Let's start on this counterfactual. They say when you don't have this world, instead you have a wide range of art made in different types of art. We think that in this debate, Gov is trying to defend what is legitimately the status quo. That's what we regret in this motion. 
happened. This is not true. What is in the status quo? Let's do analysis. We think we see tons of different examples of art. What side government tries to do in this round is focus exclusively on music, but they neglect TV shows. They neglect movies. They neglect other forms of artwork that exist. We think in TV shows, movies, the narrative that's proliferated is that black people or people of color, minorities in general, are in positions of like lower levels. They fit the typical standardized roles of society. If you see movies and depictions of Africa, you're going to see women and men looking at starving individuals, often without speaking roles, because that's how they're depicted in art. You also see this similarly in other types of TV shows. Beyond that, we think in music, people talk about their struggles with growing up in a town where they're not comfortable and where there's a lot of violence. We think this happens in the status quo. We think, importantly to note, you could have non-opulence examples of art simultaneously exist with opulence examples. So we can have examples of people being rich in art, which is what we get in the status quo, along with other examples. We just have to support a large amount of it, and we're okay with doing that on side opposition. I hope they respond to the counterfactual in their next speech. Now, let's go into side opposition's case. Two contentions for you. First, on how we benefit the marginalized. Under this contention, seven subpoints. First, we think we create a counter narrative. In the status quo, the predominant narrative surrounding minorities is that there's a problem in their treatment. Governments, political actors, all no, people, no thank you, believe in this and proliferate these ideas. Minorities are supposed to be in hard situations. They are marginalized and systematically oppressed. We think this is definitely true, but we also think that it is not exclusively true because there are rich minorities. There are people who are successful and individuals of color who are not struggling to make ends meet. However, we think no one really ever discusses that narrative or discusses this reality. Three reasons why we think this is bad. One, people are not respected enough in terms of wealth circles. You are assumed to be poor unless proven wealthy because everyone in government says minorities are systematically poor. Secondly, we think generalizations are really, really bad. If you're going to have nothing counteracting a generalization that exists in the status quo, we don't only want one narrative to happen because that creates polarization and that's not a good thing. Third and finally, we think it's an extra barrier for marginalized groups to meet and feel included and non-isolated because they're saying we have to overcome this boundary that exists. We think in our world, it is important to paint a counter narrative that demonstrates that there can be other forms of wealth and socioeconomic standings within minority communities. We think music does a wonderful job of that because when you talk about your wealth and the fact that you can exist, you're not changing the way society views minorities. Instead, what you're doing is you're showing that there can be an example of an individual who is really, really successful in the music industry and they were creative and they did well and that's really, really good and minorities can be that. You don't just have to fit the societal narrative that's pushed onto you. That's going to be good for minorities because they should be able to have hope. I'll get into that in a minute in my third subpoint. Second subpoint is on empowerment. We think that importantly, none of the four of us in this room debating are people of color. But not only that, what we decide generally cannot decide what is empowering and what is not empowering for minorities. We think that if minorities like to put this music out and create capital from it, that is good and they should be allowed to continue doing this. Why? We want minorities to feel empowered in whatever way makes them feel empowered. If this music makes you happy, if you feel like you're making a difference and doing something good in society, and that makes you feel good as an individual, that's going to be a good thing for you. Why? Because you should be able to use your music as an outlet to create something that you care about, to create something that means something to you, because that's just the function of art. If you take that away from someone and say they only have to fit one narrative and it's bad to proliferate this kind of narrative, that's really disempowering to people who feel one certain way. We don't think we have the say to decide that just like morally, but also on util benefits. We think it's better if they get to feel empowered because it's good for minorities. Third step one is under hope. People don't get this narrative in the status quo now that people can be rich. I tell you this earlier on. We think when they find out there can be someone like them, there was a meritocracy. I'm going to respond to Julia's point when I get into case. When they see that someone can be successful, that is hopeful, right? But not only hopeful of the fact that you could be successful one day, hopeful of the fact that the narrative is changing, hopeful of the fact that you don't have to be categorized as a person who is marginalized, and hopeful that in the future that you can be seen as something a whole lot more nuanced and a whole lot more. That's beneficial because it impacts people and how they're going to feel. Hope is going to be positive for your mental health. And if you're constantly feeling hopeful, it's going to be a lot better than constantly feeling negative. Fourth subpoint under this contention is role models. We think celebrities have a ton of political power and buy-in. Trust me, I'm writing a year-long history paper on it, but I mean, think about it. If Taylor Swift supports a group, other people are surely going to follow what she supports. So we think, even if it is perceptual, minorities feel like they have political power at the point at which they have success and monetary success, because money is like a prerequisite to having power and buy-in and all of that kind of stuff. So when they talk about how they have political power, we think even on a perceptual level, people feel like, oh, someone who looks like me is a role model someone's on that stage someone's voice is being they have incentive no thank you i'll take it at the end of this contention if you still want to ask one fifth step point is on viewership we think that people listening to minority artists is good and it happens more on our side why is that 
Having money is celebrated in our society, so you're hence more likely to watch art that coheres with that. This means the art that we are advocating for. Hence, minority artists get more viewership on our side, which is good because it gives, first of all, minorities more money. But why do we think this is true that people are more likely to listen to it? Because people like diversified music. You like rap music where you're talking about this wealth, or you like other kinds of music where you're talking about other things, or you like to see art that's not sad and consistently talking about oppression because no one wants to listen to sad music all the time. Some people want to hear about money. If you're getting more viewership, that means you're giving money directly to these people of color artists, the minority artists who are benefiting directly from that. We're going to want to prioritize them in the situation as the Wang Julia gives you. Sixth subpoint under this contention is mental health. We think a lot of people listen to music as a mechanism for escapism. Art is a fundamentally different experience from everyday reality and is one of the only ways people can access the different types of experience. Hence, when you listen to art, you're not going to be simply reminded of the problems in life. You're not going to be reminded of the fact that, oh, I'm in a really hard situation. But you listen to music that makes you happy makes you see another reality. We don't think we need to perpetuate music into the world of art. Sorry, we don't think we have to perpetuate problems into the world of art. Art can be happy, art can be good, and art can talk about money, and we don't understand why it has to be constantly negative. Seventh subpoint under this contention is challenging savior complex. We think that common narratives produced and orchestrated by white individuals paint Black people or people of color in specific ways. Portrayals of Africa, as I give you that example, make people have one image and one stereotype saying, you're poor, we need to help them. This is how people exist in status quo. We think this engages in savior your complexes because it can say, look, we need to help the people who are struggling. It creates a very predominant narrative. We think this is bad and we think you should be allowed to create a different narrative so that we can be wealthy. We don't have to be one way. The second contention is on quality of art. We just think that good art makes you think. Art that challenges societal norms is going to be better. If you're having to think about art, that probably makes the mar art more enjoyable for just people in general. And good art quality is going to be good for emotion about art. We would rather good art in our world. That being said, some responses to SideGov's case. Their first contention is on white public. In response to their first contention, subpoint on art depicts minorities traditionally associated with poverty. I just think this is a crazy idea. The narrative in the status quo isn't that Black people are wealthy. It's just because one person is. It doesn't make everyone wealthy. So even if you paint a narrative that one person can be wealthy, it doesn't mean like, oh, the entire community of Black people are going to be wealthy. I just think that's a real jump in overall warranting and analysis. The second subpoint is on associate success with meritocracy. But maybe this is good because Cardi B, yeah, maybe she got rich by doing something good. But what is the alternative? We think in off worlds, people feel like they have systematic reasons why they can't get out of poverty. At least in our world, they see examples of upward mobility, the ability to move up. That's good for hope. Third subpoint is that other types of minority art are better. Okay, but they literally can simultaneously exist. Also, who are we to decide what type of minority art is better in terms of this debate if it's empowering? Their fourth is like box perception of art. The small space that minorities get is now just about opulence. I just don't think this is true. There's other types of art. Gov is better discourse about this. I just don't think that's true. Minorities example, I'll do this really quickly. They say they alienate the poor and off. We say we give them escapism. We allow them to be happy. At the point at which our entire case interacts and takes out their case and their counterfactual is wrong, we are so proud to oppose. Okay, wonderful. Um, this will be a fun speech. Um, okay, uh, so um, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Zach, my pronouns are he, him. I'm going to be the member of government for Evan Streams. If you have any POIs, um, please ask them verbally. If there are no objections, then my time will begin on my first word. Also, it's going to be a little bit fast um, because there's a lot to get through given off case. Um, if anyone cannot hear, if any of the judges can't hear, just say clear um, and I'll slow down. Cool, time will begin on my first word. Side opposition is embracing a small subset of an advocacy. On side government, we say that you shouldn't only be embracing a small section of the minority communities, but rather that we should have a diverse range of art that embraces all minorities, not just the rich, couldn't be prouder to propose three things in this speech. First on the counterfactual, second op case, third gov case. Start on the counterfactual, three responses. First, we'd say that this debate is about minority produced art. We'd say that white directors showing like, poor people in Africa isn't what this debate is about. Literally look at the motion. Response number two, we can still show other ways to break stereotypes about these people. For example, we think that like showing that like diversity of experience is better. We can show a bustling South African street and all the experiences that actually exist in Africa. We'd say that this is actually a better narrative than what they are saying because it shows the true culture, the true experiences of minority communities. Third, we see that of themselves concede that wealthy art dominates the market. So they crowd out a diversity of art. 
we'd say that the amount of art that is being produced is to some extent zero sum because of the racist elite that is always going to control the amount of black art that exists within a system. We'd argue that the comparative then is what type of minority art actually exists in these spheres. But then fourth, I'm actually going to add one more. I would posit that this counterfactual doesn't engage with the fact that this motion isn't about the art itself. It's about whether we celebrate the art because yes, they try to say the status quo takes this out. There is other art being produced in the status quo, but you don't see that type of art being celebrated to the same extent that the art that they are talking about is actually celebrated in the status quo. That's where our argument about the status quo um, like takes that out. Let's go to Opcase on their first argument. I'm not going to count the total responses. I'm just going to go point by point because there's a lot. On their first, yeah. Pause, and pause time. Um, are you for celebration is that coming from like somewhere in the motion or is that just an argument that it says in the motion we should be celebrating or is it just yeah it's this house regards the prominence of celebrating opulence no, it's not this has re oh yes it is okay never mind my bad <laughs> okay um time will resume on my first word Start on their first sub point about a counter narrative, six responsive. First, we'd argue that there is literally no way they can be creating a counter narrative because they're arguing for the status quo. They're arguing for current narratives that exist in society. They're not making a counter narrative. They're just arguing for the narrative that exists. We'd argue that the status quo is really bad. We are the side that actually diverges from that. Second, we'd say that we think the alternative is that minority voices are going to be talking about their experience. Why is this comparatively better? We say that there's like people aren't respected, but how can you respect someone if you don't know their experience? experience at all. And that, at, insofar as that is true, we see that our counterfactual is a prerequisite to this argument, because in order to actually foster that respect, you need to understand the culture. Third, turn the argument. We'd say that they talk about overcoming a barrier, but now there is an un, now there is not an unattainable goal. What we would argue is that by having a barrier in the first place, a perceived barrier from a or minorities, we'd argue this is incredibly damaging, i.e. a minority now thinks this is what I need to do, and if I don't do it, I'm not living up, I'm not being a credit to my race. Response number four, turn the argument. We think that this is actively bad for minority people. The reason for this is that they try to act like minorities are a monolith. No, we'd argue that there is a lot of hatred for wealthy minorities among the minority communities. Insofar as that is true, we think that this is actually bad because the barrier to overcoming, the people don't actually see themselves in these people. Fifth, turn the argument again. They look at art in a vacuum. We would say that no, that you can't just look at art in a vacuum. We would say that having these leaders in other spheres is actually going to be better and like not just showing like wealthy, like black business leaders. That is going to be better because that is what actually is a counter narrative and actually like pushes back against larger societal narratives. Second sub point about empowerment. Two responses. First, We'd say that minorities do um, other things which simply are not celebrated as much. This is the argument I gave on the observation, which is that to some extent celebrating minority accomplishments is zero sum due to systemic barriers that exist in society. So they actually have to engage with the comparative rather than looking at their side in a vacuum. Response number two, do the weighing here. Yes, it might be good for the one artist who gets wealthy. We'd argue that if it's bad for the like race or the minority community writ large, it's always going to be bad. On their third sub point about hope, two responses. First, turn the argument. It's actually going to be false hope. We'd argue that this is going to incentivize people to enter the artistic sphere, even if it's not something that is good for them. That's really bad because it means that minorities who aren't good or interested in art feel pressured to do that because that is the only sphere in which wealth is actually shown. Second, to turn the argument again, we think that this makes minorities who don't achieve this level of wealth feel guilty that they didn't do it instead of actually recognizing that it was systemic inequalities that were the cause of all of their like ills. On their fourth sub point about how you have a role model Model. We'd say that this is entirely symmetric on both sides of the house because the white majority is going to once again to the same number of black artists in either world. This shows a mischaracterization of the motion. We are talking about minority artists in either world. The identity of the artist is the same. The only delta is the type of art that is being celebrated. We'd argue that once, once you're actually celebrating the type of art that we talk about, you get overall better benefits. On their fifth sub point about um, viewership, three responses. First, we'd say that is actually true. Um, in our society, because you see that viewership overall is going to increase when people can actually relate to the material that is being given. And when it only reflects, A, the rich, that's really bad. And B, when it only reflects experiences that account for the minority groups. We think that if it's something like a breakup or something that is a universal experience, that everyone is going to be able to actually like 
like relate to it at least to some extent. Second, we'd say that you can turn the argument, even if you don't buy that, insofar as we say that more viewership is actively bad because it promotes bad narratives, this impact is actually going to turn to us. And then third, we'd say that at best, it's just going to be a wash. They don't actually like mechanize why this is true, especially insofar as this is a celebration motion. It's not actually referring to the music being produced in the first place. On their sixth sub point about um, mental health, two responses. First, we say that art still reflects society and that yes, uh, the purpose of art isn't like activism, but it still matters. There's still an impact when someone listens to certain arts. That is the type of narrative that they start to think about in society. And then second, we think that they don't mechanize very well for why the music will make them happier. This is where you look to our point about it being more relatable, which prereqs their point, because insofar as you buy that it is more relatable, we think that it will make people have, happier. On their seventh argument, four responses. First, we think that Black artists are going to be there in both worlds or minority artists. Second, we'd say that you're still allowed to produce this art. Remember, this isn't a policy motion. It's a regret the prominence of glorifying it. We'd say that that's the delta they have to defend. Third, we'd say that escapism can still happen in other ways. And then fourth and finally, we think that representation is better than escapism. That's really to our argument of intersectional representation. Go to their second argument. First, you're just not going to be voting on it. They don't impact it. They don't warrant it. They spend 10 seconds on it. This is just don't vote like for this in a semifinals round. But even if you don't buy that, I'll respond to it anyway. We think that Op concedes that the white public likes this art more. That is their narrative. The problem with this is that um this removes the variety of art and worsens the quality of art. So you can turn the argument for us. Let's go back to our case. Four responses we hear from them. First, on our fourth sub, first sub point to how it veils the problem of race. They say this doesn't mean the entire community will be wealthy. No one will make that assumption. Sadly, not everyone is as intelligent as my opponents because the problem is that some people will at least implicitly think this. Even if it's not explicit, they'll think this. But then the second layer of analysis here is our second sub point, which is that they'll think, well, if one Black person can become wealthy, then it is on the onus of the other Black people to become wealthy as well, that it is not the problem of like systemic barriers that are preventing the success or monetary success of the Black population. Then, to our argument about meritocracy, they think this is good because of hope. The problem here is that insofar as you believe in a meritocracy, this is exactly Exactly the type of rhetoric that like bad actors can co-opt to use for social Darwinist rhetoric. The reason is that the if society was truly a meritocracy, then what would explain the economic disparities across race? The only explanation that people would have is that like people of a certain race are intrinsically different. We think this is really bad. On fosters more empathy, they say this art can simultaneously exist. Once again, they misread the motion. It's that what type of art you are celebrating, you are not celebrating this art that fosters empathy. And then in response to like, is your only perception of what art is? They say this isn't true, but they just assert that. And it's about what art is glorified. We want to glorify intersectional art, art that represents the diversity of minority communities. I couldn't be prouder to propose. All right. <clears throat> um, so I will start my time on my first word as with everyone else. Um, POIs out loud. If I don't hear them for whatever reason, just let me know, and then I will do my very best to either say yes or no. Okay. Um, that being said, is any if anyone's not ready, let me know. If not, I'll start my time on my first word. I think that there are a number of problems with the way that GovCase operates and the sort of assumptions it makes about how this actually interacts with the real world. The way this is going to go, I'm going to give a sort of a couple of overviews and some weighing there. Then I'm going to go actually actually down the flow, respond to the like insane number of things that Zach just said. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the counterfactual. They say that the counterfactual is that either you have a wide range of art made or that you have sort of just this art made. And sort of what Zach adds is that it's always going to be zero sum. So you're either celebrating this art or other art. I don't think this is true for a couple of reasons. First of all, we think that like in the status quo, we see that other kinds of art are also set are also celebrated. Notice that in this notice that in the motion it says that even though it's prominent that we celebrate this, that's necessarily not mutually exclusive to say celebrating other things. I also don't think that art is zero sum. Like that is, I think that you can create a sort of infinite amount of art, and that we think that therefore, like on our side, you sort of get more selection in what art you can actually listen to and actually enjoy. Okay, so I think that I, I think that basically she sort of doesn't respond to everything that Sophie gives you here. And I think that ultimately, we can admit that on both sides, there's sort of a wide range of art 
being made, we also think that it's sort of uniquely important because we think that at the point at which sort of this uniquely empowers minorities as opposed to sort of what they propose in their counterfactual, that's really important. Now let's think, now let's talk about how this actually interacts point with people. Point of clarification, stop time. Yeah. Um, to be clear, so are you changing your counterfactual from the one in the LOC about like how like minorities are going to be depicted in like their stereotypical way? No. Okay. That's, that's still, okay, cool. Okay, I'm going to unpause time. So we think it's really important to actually think about how this interacts with people's views. We think that, yes, it is true that, that say, like, people in society sort of loosely base their views on pop culture. But I think the assumption that sort of like the general white public is going to form their views on, say, the experiences of minorities from this art alone, I don't think that's true. Why is that? We think that, 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 we think that minorities, first of all, like sort of express like their experiences in other ways. You see this talked about, you know, in political campaigns, media, et cetera, et cetera. We don't think this is the only place from where these people are sort of actually getting their idea here. And at the end of the day, we don't think that, say, hearing a Cardi B song about how she has a bunch of money and has a cool song or something is actually going to sort of form your view of how you view minorities. We think that comparatively, we think that while it may be true that like on our side, maybe this also sort of won't completely form how minorities think. We think it's more likely to sort of influence minorities because even if it doesn't say change how they like view the world or something, we think that it actually offers them a unique counter narrative to the rest of society. I'm going to talk about this more specifically, or I guess here I can sort of get, um, we think that here I can actually just sort of get into case because I think this sort of, um, response here so okay in terms of this in, in terms of our counter narratives point zach says there, there's sort of no counter narrative that, that, that this can't be a counter narrative since it's in the status quo i think that he misses the point the point we're making is that the, the sort of narrative we paint of opulence existing in sort of minority art is a counter narrative to how the rest of society portrays minorities insofar as the rest of society sort of portrays minorities as not being wealthy and not sort of no, act, we think no thank you that we uniquely act sort of alternative to that then Zach says, oh, the status quo is bad. We think, yes, there are problems with the status quo. The assertion we're making is that their world is worse. Then they talk about, then they say that the alternatives that minorities talk about their experiences. Once again, I don't think that these two are, are mutually exclusive. Then they say, oh, turn, minorities think that they need to be successful and they can. Zach keeps saying this. This doesn't work for a number of reasons. First of all, we as a society realize that what celebrities achieve is not what the rest of us achieve. That is, we think that everyone sees celebrities, not just minorities. Everyone sees celebrities, but we recognize that not everyone becomes a celebrity. Like, we don't think that like when I say see a celebrity, whether that be like as like some minority or me myself, we don't think we don't see the link to how that means that like, oh, I must necessarily become a celebrity because the celebrity is how the average person turns out. We think that we recognize that even within our society, the way we talk about celebrities is being sort of exceptional people. And hence, it's necessarily not the case that there's an expectation that the average person is going to turn out to be a celebrity. If there is an expectation that the average person is going to become a celebrity, then then that definitely she, that definitionally sort of shifts how we think of celebrities. Then they say, um, then they say that maybe this is sort of good for, for sort of artists who are popular, but it's sort of bad for the rest of society. Um, I, I think that, first of all, this response just relies on the rest of their case for how this is bad for society. Also, I think that actually sort of getting money to like, to like minority artists is actually very important. That is, if in the status quo, there's a lot of different kinds of music, but this is the kind of music that is sort of becoming popular. We think there's probably a reason for this. If this is, if this is what the Grammys are showing, there's probably a reason for this. The Grammys have incentives to show art that is popular at the time. This art gets popular because people listen to it and people go to these concerts. That's sort of how this mechanism works. Why is this important? We think that, first of all, if this is popular art, then it's probably the case that minorities enjoy it and listen to it. And also, just in terms of the general public, if it's the case that this is the kind of music that the general public enjoys. We think that if we didn't have this, then we'd have less of the general public listening to minority art of this kind. Why is that bad? We think that then minority artists would get less money. Why is that bad? First of all, like obviously for them, it's bad if they're getting less money. But in society generally, we think that celebrities and people with a lot of money have a lot of power in society. First of all, they just have a lot of like media coverage. They also have a lot of money they can put into things like political campaigns. So here we think that at the end of the day, we can claim that we get more money for minorities. Um. Then they sort of talk about how it's false hope. Once again, see my response about how not everyone uh, has to sort of thinks they're going to be a celebrity. Then they say that the sort of role model here is symmetric. We don't think this is true. We think that insofar as the Grammys have incentives to show popular artists, if you have less popular artists in the status quo, that's why. But also having role models that tell you that like you can actually like, achieve things. You know 
good. No, thank you. Then they say that more viewership is actually bad because more of because there's more of this being shown in the status quo. Once again, this also relies on their case for why this is bad. And we also turn this because we think that more money actually leads to sort of more signaling of minorities having more of an art, more power um, in the status quo. OK. The, also, what I think is really important here, and this, I, like, I sort of put this way at the end of the speech, is that most of their case, and I'll talk about their second point in a bit, but most of their case impacts how the general public views minorities, whereas most of our case actually impacts how the minorities themselves feel. We think that at the end of the day, it's very probable the claim we make that there are going to be certain people who are empowered by this. We think that, yes, maybe not everyone is empowered by the same thing, but we think that we offer a, cho a choice to people who, who feel empowered by this. We think there are people who are empowered by this, and we think that we shouldn't be the ones deciding what empowers minorities and what doesn't. We think that if this empowers minorities, it should exist. We also think that we actually help minorities in terms of how we influence them than that. That is, we think that if the general public public say thinks something about minorities, the mechanism for how this actually helps minorities is much more unclear. That is, maybe they can claim this leads to some sort of policy change, but that's sort of volatile because first of all, it's an unclear mechanism insofar as like democracy isn't perfect. Things like corporations can ruin that. Also, even if they do sort of access some sort of policy change, it's likely to be done badly because the people in power are often like white men who probably won't do this well. On the other hand, we more directly influence minorities by actually sort of empowering them directly. Now it's in response to our, uh, now in response to our second point, Zach sort of says that it's like a stupid aesthetics point. Like I like aesthetics, but like, I don't think it's winning the round. I don't think that this is something I need to spend time on. Now, in terms of like, um, okay. Now in terms of sort of, sort, sort of the gov case, I, um, I, I, I like sort of add more, um, Reputations to what uh, Sophie says, and then and, and then also sort of Zag what here says is once again that like there's he sort of once again goes back to this idea that because like minorities will see minorities be other minorities becoming celebrities, they must then necessarily assume that like something's wrong with them if they don't. Once again, you can see my response to that. Then in terms of like their meritocracy point, Zach talks about how like this meritocracy narrative can be co-opted by other things, but we think that insofar as first of all, people aren't forming their views entirely on this. If you're a minority, you you know that there are problems because they face you. And if you're not a minority, we talk enough about um, the problems. The fact that we can just assume as a premise in this debate that there are problems shows that we clearly talk a lot about the fact that there's problems. What this means is that the the awareness of problems exists on either side, except on their side, Gov is telling minorities, oh, you're like not going to be able to succeed. While on our side, we're telling you that even though there's problems, we actually offer them hope. We think that fundamentally, if people don't have hope, they're probably not going to live happy, fulfilled lives. We better access both empowerment and also on the mental health level, just having hope about living a good life. For all those reasons, strongly urge you not valid. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll begin my time starting now. Three things in the speech. First, some characterization of the round. Second, two things Gab will say in their PMR and why neither of them win. I'm really bad at predicting Julia's collapses. I hope I got it right this time. Third, some op ballots. Let's get into characterization. First, Zach's speech claims to su support diversity, but rather operates in a world advocating for one type of art, saying that minority art that is only good if it represents every minority, but not the rich ones. Seems a little exclusionary to me, Zach, but all minority art is what side opposition promotes in this debate. We say should all equally be celebrated and you should be proud to propose. That being said, let's do a few other pieces of characterization. First, I want to talk about where narratives come from. Second, I want to talk about this counterfactual. First, where do narratives come from? Adrian gives you this brilliant analysis at the top of his speech. He says people get narratives that exist from the government. They come from other people in society. And he says, yes, you get it from music. But in my PLFC, I tell you very importantly that music is going to dictate these narratives, but it's art. It's not as powerful as you're constantly hearing it from the governments. What does this mean? We we think you get these narratives in either world that minorities are going to be poor. This is the predominant narrative that people are going to hear. So that being said, let's get into the characterization of this round under the counterfactual. We think, as Adrian tells you again, that multiple forms of art can be celebrated in the status quo and that it does happen in the status quo. You can see different types of celebrities being celebrated for singing different types of songs, growing up in hard areas and growing up in different types of areas. Beyond that, we think infinite art can be created and celebrated. We see no bright line as to one part has to be. That being said, Gubb will say two 
two things in their PMR, here's why neither win. First, God will tell you there are other types of art that are better for minorities. But first, we just refuse to believe that there's a better type of art for minorities. I tell you anything that is empowering to a minority should inherently be something that is celebrated, given that it's art that they choose to create. They give you no bright line for why we should say this art is not worthy of being celebrated because it's not good enough at representing minorities versus why we should celebrate something else. But secondly, Adrian tells you we simply can coexist and celebrate all of it. They never prove to you why there has to be a bright line, why you have to choose one, why you have to choose the other. At the point at which the impact of only celebrating good art is actually disempowering other types of celebrities and we're choosing which minorities we should celebrate and which we shouldn't, we think that's probably pretty problematic and at best not winning. But even beyond that, we think that it's probably kind of true that the impact here is relatively small because you get this art in either world, you're not getting a change in the amount of art, so therefore you're not getting any difference in the celebration level. So the impact here is probably a wash at best, not winning. The second thing they'll probably try and tell you is that art should depict people associated in hard situations with poverty so that they're relating. But first, we tell you tons of other types of art represent people in poverty. We tell you that there's paintings. We tell you that there's TV. We tell you all these types of things. The point at which is this non-unique. It doesn't have to be proliferated through music and artists. We are so proud to say that we don't think any of these impacts flow through. That being said, let's go into the off collapse three for you. First, let's talk about empowerment. Adrian does a really good job at weighing this at the end of his speech. We say in our world, we offer choice for people to feel empowered. We can't tell you in either world who is going to feel more empowered through what type of art. What we can show for 100% probability is we're not eliminating one person's form of power. Why is power really important? First, look to hope. We say hope is a prerequisite to feeling successful in society. You feel like you can get better success and better policy, better impacts for you in the future if you're hopeful. That's going to be really important for mental health and mental health of minorities. We think we directly benefit the mental health of minorities because we are the only side that gives them hope. We're the only side that shows them a positive narrative because if you show a singular narrative to everyone else, hope is never allowed to grow. That means we're going to win here because of the scope of the amount of minorities affected by hope is 100% probability that you're going to have a role model versus in their world, you have none. But beyond that, we also have 100% probability that you have a chance to feel empowered because we can prove to you if you're making this artist you, art, you do feel empowered. They have no way of solving for you by telling you that you're going to feel more empowered by another form of art. So this directly beats that impact. The second place you vote for us and the cleanest place you vote for us on Wang is what exists in the status quo in this counter narrative. We tell you that in the status quo, government prioritizes a certain narrative that minorities are poor. There's literally zero other narrative that exists for minorities being rich. So here's why we win this round. This narrative is the largest delta in this debate. It shows that minorities can be wealthy and changes a stereotype. Why is this narrative important? First, it makes people think and impacts everyone. So every single person is being changed by this narrative. Second, the way people think is a prerequisite to how people act. If you are thinking more positively, you're going to act better. We impact out in my first speech, I tell you impact on mental health, feeling included and more nuanced minorities. Why does this win? Because if everyone in society is approaching minorities in more nuanced ways, it means the policy being passed is better. That means the impacts to actual minorities is going to be good. You're going to weigh the impacts of minorities in this world. Third place you vote is on money for artists. We say making black people rich, giving them that money is going to be important for them. That means they have buy-in power to create activism, to have a voice in politics. You vote for us here because the impact of that is going to outweigh any impact of potentially showing minority art. And then you can show that type of art in their world if you're able to get the money in the first place. Because we it link into all of their impacts, they have none left standing. So proud to oppose. Okay. Okay. Is everyone ready? Okay. Then starting time in three, two, one. That was a lot, but I'm going to tell you right now that Sophie and Adrian just won the debate for me and Zach because they refute and knife their own arguments like three times over. I wanna start with a clarification about the counterfactual, then why op defeats themselves, then two clashes, society and minorities. Firstly, on just the counterfactual, op says they can get diversity too. The reason why they can't is their own analysis. They say that this type of art, this opulence, is the most attractive art to the white public. They say it's the most popular. That is a concession out of Sophie's speech, and then Adrian's, and then Sophie's again. That means that naturally, because this is most appealing to a white audience, this type of art crowds out the other art. When people have a choice to look at beautiful diamonds as opposed to a Black artist talking about their struggles, they're going to look at the diamonds. That means they don't get diversity when they don't have that, when you're not celebrating that. We get the diversity. We get a range of minority experiences that account for full humanity, that normalize, that humanize, and that empathize them. Okay. 
that just means for the counterfactual, everything about our counterfactual still applies. That is still our comparative. They still don't get those impacts. What are the three concessions, what are the three contradictions that op gives that are the reason they can't win the round? The first is that I, well, the thing I just said, which is that op says three times that opulent art is always going to be the most celebrated because it has the most appeal to a white majoritarian art uh, audience. That means that any of their impacts about diversity are out because it is the most popular. It means any of their impacts about empowerment, any of their impacts about quality of art are out because there's an unnatural squeezing out of other types of art that might be just as good. We could assume that all of these types of art are equally good. The problem is their art gets the most attention. We just want equality for the types of discourse you're having about art. That means that takes out like a third of their case. Second thing they tell you that they are able to change that. Okay, so here's what they do. They refute our whole case by saying no one cares about art. None, no one is going to be in, none of their influ like perspectives about African Americans are going to be influenced by art. But our whole case is people are going to be influenced by art. We are a counter narrative because people are going to be influenced by art because when they see a black person wearing a chain, no, they won't think they're rich, but yes, they'll think they're rich. That is a contradiction that knifes the entire debate. You can't have a response that one says no one responds to the narrative and then the other hand says that everyone does. But the third contradiction adds on to this, and this is important. Adrian spends about two minutes explaining to us with nuance and detail why people are have the capacity to understand that celebrities are different from themselves. They say, no, people won't conflate their experiences because people understand celebrities are different. Okay, pause, apply that to about a third of their argumentation about empowerment, about counter narratives. If white Americans are able to make the distinction between Cardi B and an African American living in a poor neighborhood, per Adrian's own analysis, none of the counter narrative argumentation works at all. That takes out op, they cannot win. Why do we win? Two things, society and the minorities. Society, and I want to just like frame why I think this is important. First of all, I think that society is composed of these people too, these minorities, which is important. Secondly, this doesn't just change policy decisions. It changes your day-to-day -day interactions. It changes the microaggressions and the experiences that you have when you talk to these people, which adds up to influence the mental health of these minorities living in the country. But also on scope, this is the largest number of people that are influenced. I think that it is naive to say that art doesn't influence the way people interact with politics or the way that they think about society. I think art does. I think it does does influence the way that you vote, the way that you care about your neighbors and the issues that affect them. What did they say on society? They said a counter narrative. I just beat it twice by their own analysis. I'm going to do it some more. Firstly, and importantly, a dropped piece of analysis from us. We said the problem that OP doesn't identify is that the counter narrative isn't good. And the reason for that is people don't like rich people any rich people, middle class people, poor people don't like rich people. If you're saying that African Americans are depicted as poor and the way to solve that is depicting them as the billionaires that people want to eat. That doesn't make any sense. I don't like rich people. I don't like the Kardashians. They're the same race as me. So I think the problem with that is that the counter narrative doesn't work insofar as people don't like it and people don't buy into it. This is important in terms of weighing for two things. I. The first reason why I think that this is important is that it's a prerequisite weighing. You will weigh up on this before anything else, because all of their analysis relies on you believing that people react positively to this imaging of African Americans wearing chains. We tell you they don't, they turn against it and they don't like it. Okay, second, so we just win that because I think we beat that argumentation, but we also told you all of this content offensively about the way that people interact with this messaging that makes them feel like there's a more empathetic, diverse range of African-American or minority experiences that they can relate to, that they care about. They can understand that culture. That means they're nicer and it means they're nicer in the voting booth. On, on scope and magnitude, I think that that has the largest impact in this round. It influences real policy and real decision-making. Secondly, in minorities, they talk about representation and empowering. We get it better. Representation is better. We show a diversity of experiences, which represents a wider range of people better. On probability, I think it's easier to represent people when you show diversity. And showing false hope is actively bad. I think that we show a re realistic, diverse range of experiences. I'm proud. I've never been prouder to propose. Love you guys. Great round. Honestly, the best round of debate I've ever been in. Wonderful round, guys. That was a wonderful round. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the results are in. Uh, it was a 2-1 decision for Gov.
Sorry, did everyone hear me? <laughs> yes. Oh, um, okay. Sorry. I yes. can start with my RFD, I guess. I'm sorry? Um, should I start with my RFD or who was the person that voted off? Um, I voted op. Okay. Um, first off, I agree with um, the debaters that this was uh, uh, this was the best debate that I've ever judged, but I haven't been judged that long. Certainly the, be I, the best debate that I heard this weekend. So really tremendous, tremendous uh, work. Um, it, it was very close, very difficult. I thought it could go either way. Ultimately, I just bought into um, op counterfactual. Uh, I, I thought that um, uh, I think, you know, the, the, their idea that it's not zero sum, that in the uh, absence, um, you know, of, uh, I, I won't, I, I just, I, I bought into their, their theirs ultimately, um, but uh, I thought both sides were um, debated uh, very well. Okay, I can go next. I think that like, the first place I voted for Gov was on this analysis that like the celebration of opulent art will be consumed most by white people. That was kind of like part of that like contrafactual debate. And I think this like cuts out immediately the first five op sub points, like the narratives, like, empowerment, like hope, role models, etc. Like that's like the first place when I when that was um given like by like Julia that then I started um to buy gov because genuinely i think op was winning my flow until maybe like and uh until like the start of like the, the final gov, gov speech and then because of that like the only thing that is left left on the op flow is like the idea of more money to like minority artists and like mental health and then i'm now weighing this against the idea of like unity through like empathy changing how people perceive identity like better discourse etc but i'm gonna ultimately prefer this idea of um of like the changing perceptions because i do buy into this idea that in, the, in this contractual idea that like they cannot be in tasco equally prioritized because we see that like the, the current celebration of opulence is more received by white people and therefore like disadvantages minorities and yeah that's like my abridged version so i don't have any questions um i pretty much felt exactly the same way as Nora, like word for word. Um, but yeah, all, I too was um, planning, I, I, I was I was planning to vote for op until the last speech, I think, where um, first on the counterfactual, I bought what Gov said in the last speech that if the public prefers opulent art, it'll naturally crowd out everything else. And that sort of, or the, I mean, that, 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 um, that 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 left the op with very little, I think, once that was said. Um, and second, the idea that I, I bought the Gov's idea that um, in terms of the counter narrative, which the op says is the most important place to vote, um, or at least easiest place to vote, um, I bought the idea that that creates a worse image of minorities because rich everybody hates rich people. Um, generally speaking, um, those were the two main things that I focused on. And like Nor said in the end, um, the gov just had the bigger impacts where op really just had being better for the specific artists um but overall like you all have been saying this was a really really good round but definitely the best parley round i've ever seen so great job everybody congrats guys i'm so happy for you thank, thank you. you that was you were like so amazing you were so amazing love you all congrats <laughs> in the fucking finals <laughs>